Hello, everybody, and welcome to Through Time and Clades. My name is Joan. And I'm Albert. And today we come to episode seven of my series, Humanity of Prologue, about the origins and evolution of the hominin lineage. And, um, but before we, uh, you know, jump into that, uh, Albert, how have things been on your end? Oh, things are all right on my, on my end of things. Uh, I'm still, still quite busy, uh, uh, still dealing with a couple of different research projects, but, uh, they're, they're all coming along and I've been making progress. So I'm reasonably, you know, happy with that. <laughs> uh, how are you? Uh, I've been good. Um, just been busy with the usual things, mm -hmm. uh, still working through Robert's history of the world Had a sweet, it's slow pace. And, uh, as well as like, you know, gathering all sorts of research, uh, for this particular episode, because, uh, you know, now we're coming to areas of paleoanthropology where there is just a lot of literature. Yeah, this is a big topic, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it is. And um, I can tell you, sometimes it is just a pain in the butt to, like, get a state of affairs situation for some of these topics. Mm -hmm. um, like, uh, well, I, I'll mention some of them as we go through. But uh, I, I think I've been able to bring up a, um, a fairly accurate you know, state of the field in terms of t today's episode. So uh, That's I feel good. pretty good about that. Um, and uh, incidentally, I've decided to call this episode the original cave people, mm. simply because you know, whenever somebody thinks of a stereotypical caveman, right, you know, they usually think of a Neanderthal. Right. Um, or rather, you know, what popular culture has told them a Neanderthal was. <laughs> right. <laughs> in reality, surprise, surprise, there's a there's a lot to the Neanderthals that a lot of non-specialists might not know about. Mm -hmm. uh, they were far from the dumb, brutish club draggers that people have imagined, you know, in, in almost every way possible. Um, Neanderthals were as human as we are. Mm -hmm. So we're going to spend the next few hours or so just talking about them. So let's jump right in. Cool. So on the next slide here, um, after covering some six million years or so of hominin evolution and further beyond you know we finally come to the fork in the road uh, this is the last common ancestry our species homo sapiens shares with any other organism and that just so happens to be the lineage to which the neanderthals and a closely related species the denisovans belong to uh, we're going to put our species to the side for the for like most of this episode um and just kind of focus our attention on this now extinct branch that I've sort of highlighted in the lighter brown here. Um, we come to know quite a lot about these fellow human species, more than we could ever dream of. Mm. And yet there's still much to discover and discuss. Um, what we do know at least is that both the Neanderthals and Denisovans had large parts of Eurasia to themselves, uh, with the former living throughout much of Europe and Western Asia, and the latter, so far as we can tell, living further eastward though their ranges did overlap to an extent. Um, Anatomy-wise, uh, they were very robust in build, they had big long skulls and large muscles and joints, but otherwise they were very much like our species. Um, in fact, uh, it would be completely accurate to say that they were among our ancestors. The Homo sapiens interbred with these two species on multiple occasions, and it's slowly being revealed that most, if not all, of the humans alive today have Neanderthal and Denisovan genes mm. inside them. Um, we're we're going to see what this truly means towards the end of this episode. Um, but first, we have to confront some of the biggest mysteries in paleoanthropology today. Um, even though we can be confident in the phylogeny that I've displayed here, um, just beneath the surface lies a ton of discourse. <laughs> and I'll just say flatly, there is no consensus on just how Homo sapiens and our closest relatives exactly evolved. Wow. You know, we can't seem to pin down a specific time in the geologic past, and we can't pin down a possible location of origin beyond very general terms. Um, and a big part of this lies in the human fossil record, and with one problematic species in particular. Mm. And if we go to the next slide, we will meet them. Um, I'd like to introduce you all to Mauer One. Uh, this is the jawbone here at the right. Um, in 1907, 
a mostly complete jawbone was unearthed near the town of Heidelberg in Germany. The following year, the industrialist and later anthropologist Otto Schotenzak thought that the jaw was distinct enough from the other then known hominin fossils in its sheer size. It was, it was a big jawbone, and he gave it the name Homo heidelbergensis. And this specimen has since been given proper radiometric dating and is currently thought to be roughly 609,000 years old. Now, uh, I say roughly because that date was given a margin of error of plus or minus 40,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. Um, and, you know, for many decades afterwards, that name was only associated with this particular jaw. As more and more human fossils were unearthed across Eurasia and Africa, dating to a period between 600 and 200,000 years ago, different paleoanthropologists tried to make sense of their diversity. Uh, some of them uh, saw them as members of Homo erectus, at least of a more derived anatomy than those of the typical erectine grade. Um, and others saw similarities with Homo sapiens or with Neanderthals. And still others saw them as different enough from all of these and gave them their own scientific names. Finally, around the late 1970s, there was an attempt by anthropologist Chris Stringer to settle the map. He examined many of these skulls and saw enough similarities among them to suggest that they were all actually related to each other. And not only that, they had something to do with the ancestry of both living Homo sapiens and the extinct Neanderthals, whom at the time he lumped with our species as a subspecies. So he referred to them as Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, as opposed to our current living members would be Homo sapiens sapiens. And so all of those skulls were assigned to Homo sapiens sensulato, or as they were known in the popular literature, archaic Homo sapiens. So not quite living humans, but not quite Neanderthals either. Sort of a, a grade, if you will. Uh, some years after that, Stringer was doing further research on these fossils with another big name in paleontology, Bjorn Curtin. And they felt that there actually were enough distinctions between our species and the Neanderthals to warrant their separation. So now we have the latter as Homo neanderthalensis, where it's more or less remained in the present day. Uh, and that left all those 600 to 200,000 year old skulls to deal with. You know, it didn't seem right to call them Homo sapiens anymore. So they looked back on the older literature, and when Schotenzak coined Homo heidelbergensis, you know, in 1907, they, they looked at that paper, and they used that name for all of these specimens. And so, thus, the hypothesis went, Homo erectus, or something like it, evolved into Homo heidelbergensis, which represented the common ancestor of the Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. And uh, even today in popular paleo media, you know, this idea has remained widely known. Um, I certainly remember reading about it. Uh, I don't know about you, Albert. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, however, you know, there were a, a number of cracks throughout this entire thing. Um, for one, the Maurer one jaw, despite, you know, being given the distinct name of Homo heidelbergensis, you know, it never really got the sort of complete species definition that other hominins have received. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's just a jawbone. There aren't enough features to really help other paleoanthropologists gain a complete understanding of what this species was supposed to be like. Um, yes, you know, Stringer and colleagues used this jaw in their analyses and found features linking it to the other skulls, but those supposed features were not actually shared among all of the skulls concerned. Some of the fossils had clear similarities with each other, you know, overlaps in cranial capacity or you know, reduced prognathism, uh, particular angles of certain parts of the skull and the jaws. But, you know, in total, there were differences that could not be ignored. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that the authors considered Homo heidelbergensis to be ancestral to both our species and the Neanderthals should clue you in on another crack in the system. You know, some of the fossils were more similar to Neanderthals than to Homo sapiens, and vice versa. And others were so different from those two species that they could really be more readily allied with the erectines than any more derived uh, hominins. Hmm. And of course, as more species of the supposed Homo heidelbergensis 
uh, were, have been, you know, better studied, they too brought their own problems to this hypothesis. And uh, this has been leading a number of researchers to argue that we should probably abandon the name Homo heidelbergensis and just, you know, wait until more evidence is found before mm. we can start putting these sorts of names on these specimens. Now, uh, we'll go to the next slide. You'll kind of see what I'm talking about here. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. So this timeline slash phylogeny might look like a bit of a mess, but uh, let me explain. So all the dots in red uh, with corresponding photos are just some of the 20 or more specimens that have previously been lumped into Homo heidelbergensis. Uh, for example, you can clearly see the Maurer 1 jaw at the top left. Um, just for a frame of reference, by the way, um, Bodo, Saldanha, and Cobway 1, all those specimens hail from Africa. Everybody else comes from Europe here on this chart. Um, the dots show the time when these specimens were fossilized. And as you can see, there's quite a bit of range here between 600 and 200,000 years ago. Um, but, you know, if you move further in time to beyond 600,000 years ago or so, you know, you find that there are gaps in the hominin record. You know, we have yet to find any specimens that could be conceivably allied with any of these specimens and species that have been unearthed, you know, more closely related to us and the Neanderthals than to, say, Homo antecessor. Mm. Um, the brown lines, of course, represent the phylogeny of Homo sapiens and our closest relatives, you know, which we can be pretty confident about. Um, but it's where the elongated ovals are that lie the uncertainties. You know, estimates for the divergence time of our lineage and those of the Neanderthals and the Denisovans range anywhere from 800,000 years ago to as recent as 500,000 years ago. And similarly, the divergence time for the Neanderthals and the Denisovans ranges anywhere from as young as 381,000 years ago to as old as 500,000 years ago. And on top of that, some anthropologists think that the evidence points to an even older date than that. Um, John Hawkes, for example, has written about genetic studies that argue that you know, the date of divergence between the Neanderthals and the Denisovans should be older than 700,000 years ago. Wow. So, you know, even though we're clear about what the phylogeny looks like, timing wise, we have no clue right mm. now. Mm. Um, at the very least, it seems, given what we know about human interbreeding, the anatomical and genetic distinctions that led Homo sapiens and the Neanderthal lineage on divergent paths must have evolved and accumulated slowly over time, mm. not suddenly. Now, I mentioned previously about further studies on supposed Homo heidelbergensis specimens, casting doubt towards the recognition as such. And one of these cases regards the site of Atapuerca in Spain. Now, here in the Pit of Bones, or Cima de los Huesos, archaeologists have unearthed thousands of human fossils, and these date back to around 430,000 years ago. They are in very good condition, and many parts of the skeleton are completely known. Now, the researchers who initially dug up those bones and studied them saw similarities with other fossils that were lumped into Homo heidelbergensis, and so classified the humans in that species, even though they also noted that their anatomy was reminiscent of later Neanderthals. Now, the bones are so well preserved that Amazingly, DNA was able to be extracted from them. Uh, one of the oldest instances of ancient DNA that we have for a specimen that's 430,000 years ago. Of course, those dates have been getting you know older and older. Some of you may have seen in the news just now that they recovered like million-year-old DNA from a mammoth. Mm, They've been right. able to study that. That's awesome. Um, I might have to talk about that a little later. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, we, now we have something that we could use to compare with other humans and try to figure out evolutionary history. And it turned out that the bones were very closely related to Neanderthals. Um, the Atapuerca lineage diverged after the split with Denisovans, but before the more classic type Neanderthals evolved. Um, that is, fossils that pa paleoanthropologists, you know, have no doubts like, oh, this is a Neanderthal. You know, there's no, there's no doubts about that. Um, and what's even more amazing is that the Atapuerca fossils contain Denisovan mitochondrial DNA, wow. which suggests that there was interbreeding between the Neanderthal and Denisovan lines beforehand, only for the signature to be kind of chipped away as further interbreeding commenced with descendant groups. Mm 
Now, the authors of those DNA studies have since argued that the Adipuerca fossils shouldn't be called Homo heidelbergensis at all. Uh, some even go as far as to say that, like, oh, these are early Neanderthals. Let's mm -hmm. call them Homo neanderthalensis and extend the range known for that species, um, which would you know bring that to about 180,000 years earlier than the oldest known classic Neanderthals. Now, this really was one of the big nails in the coffin that led many anthropologists to consider dropping Homo, neander Homo heidelbergensis altogether. Um, and the other concerns, the timing of it all, too. You recall the hypothesis that Homo heidelbergensis is supposed to be ancestral to both Homo sapiens and the Neanderthal Denisovan lineage. Now, recall the mystery surrounding just when these species diverge from each other. If Homo heidelbergensis is supposed to be our common ancestor, then you'd expect, at least, that all, or at least most of these different fossils to be a little bit older mm -hmm. than the divergence time of those lineages. Um, yet that's not what we see. Um, I mean, the Maurer one jaw comes out as the oldest known Homo heidelbergensis specimen, but everybody else postdates these divergence times or is included within them. You know, some are even contemporaneous with Homo sapiens itself, uh, like Cowboy One over here. Um, without going too much further into these details, which can be a little bit, you know, jarring, um, I, I do tend to agree with these anthropologists that lumping so many disparate and differently fossiled remains into a singular species is probably not the best practice right now. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, to do so would be to mask what is most likely a very complex evolutionary process that we've only just begun to make sense of, you know, right. without better dating or potential ancient DNA from any of these fossils, you know, it, it wouldn't be responsible to look at all this and argue for any one hypothesis or another. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like I recognize that some anthropologists have tried to reconcile all of this mess by saying, oh, well, okay, let's just lump all the Eurasian stuff uh, as proto-Neanderthals and all the African stuff as proto-Sapiens, you know, but, but, and then still keep the Homo heidelbergensis name mm -hmm. for like the Eurasian stuff and, and give the African fossils another name. But that, you know, even that wouldn't be a good idea right now because we don't know. Mm -hmm. We don't know if that's the case. Uh, so for the time being, uh, the middle Pleistocene of Eurasia and Africa is, and I'm going to quote Chris Stringer here, who has since changed his stance on this issue, um, it's a muddle in the middle regarding human evolution at this point in the past. You know, because of all this uncertainty, we really can't even be sure where the common ancestor of Homo sapiens and the Neanderthal Denisovan line evolved. You know, it's a similar situation with the origin of the genus Homo. You know, Africa and Eurasia seem to have acted as like one continuous habitat that humans were inhabiting and moving back and forth between the continents. You know, so we can't say, for example, that this common ancestor lived in Africa with one line going into Eurasia to become the Neanderthals and Denisovans and the other just staying put and evolving into Homo sapiens, mm -hmm. you know, which has been a popular hypothesis for some time now. Um, but again, you know, there, there is there's too much uncertainty. Um and you know, that, let's not forget that there are several other problematic fossils at all that have kind of stayed outside this discourse for the time being, mm -hmm. um, as we'll see on the next slide here. Um, there have been also a fair number of other human fossils across Eurasia that have so far proved even more troubling to deal with <laughs> than the Heidelberg material. Um, and just for the record, I'm going to save the African fossils for the next episode. You know, that, that's more relevant to the story of Homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. Um, these fossils have at various times been given their own scientific names, controversially classified as currently known species, or just left unclassified until further work is done. And so just to kind of quickly go through the roster here, um, we have the Tottevel fossils from France, uh, dating 550 to 400,000 years ago. Now, the features on the skull, most notably the large brow ridge and the prognathic face, uh, have pointed many researchers in the direction of Homo erectus to indicate that you know it's a European member of that species. Um, of course, definitive fossils of Homo erectus come from Eastern Eurasia. So to find one so far west would be interesting. Um, they could very well belong to another unknown erectine species. Uh, but some other anthropologists point out that you know that they they are favoring a hypothesis in the direction of more derived humans. You know. These bones might just be one of those transitional early Neanderthals that, you know, like the Adipurka bones, um, but we're just not sure. Um, it's, it's a classic transitional fossil. It's got a lot of features of older 
and newer humans and we can't really figure out where it's supposed to go. Um, likewise, we have the Petrolona fossils from Greece around 350,000 years ago. Uh, this one may be a similar case to the Tatavel skull. You know, maybe this is another one of those early Neanderthals. Um, but again, others still find this as a, a European erectime. But maybe having something to do with Neanderthals? Again, it's all about which hypothesis you prefer. You know, whether like Homo erectus has anything to do with the origins of our species in Neanderthals, mm. um, which the phylogeny is a little bit tricky on. The last European fossil I'll highlight here is the Soprano skull from Italy. Now, this is roughly 450,000 years old. Uh, the initial description of these remains aligned them with Homo antecessor and possibly with Homo sapiens too. Um, but there was one study in 2003 by uh, Francisco Malegni. Uh, him and colleagues went in a different direction with this material, and they coined a whole new species for this fossil. Uh, they call it Homo sapiensis. Um, now, I, I should state now that the majority of paleoanthropologists don't recognize the Soprano skull as a new species. They, they don't follow that, that naming uh, paradigm. Uh, but a, a number of them have previously considered that all three of these European fossils were Homo heidelbergensis. Um, of course, again, it's a name we're trying to avoid here. Hmm. Um, let's uh, move towards East Asia on the next slide. Um, here we find another you know, handful of skulls that have come into their own in recent years because most of them might have something to do with Denisovans, who have previously not been known from very good fossils. Um, we have the Dali skull from Shanxi and the uh, um, Jinyushan skull from Liaoning, who are both Chinese fossils, dating to about 260,000 years ago. Uh, they have fairly large and wide skulls. Um, they don't match anything known for Neanderthals, so-called Heidelbergs, or even Erectines. Um, given that we don't have complete material from Denisovans, these may represent early members of that lineage, um, you know, in the same way that the Adipuerca fossils represent early Neanderthals. Um, it will be interesting to see if further fossil evidence from, you know, definite Denisovans matches with these skulls, but the fact that the, this material is now being, like, seriously considered to have something to do with Denisovans is really fascinating. Mm. Um, now, the Molodong skull, oh boy, mm. this is another fascinating case. Uh, I remember seeing the news for this find you know, when it first came out. I was in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I even did an art project on it at some point. Huh. Um, now, this, uh, this skull and its uh, associated material has been dated to a period of time that is stupidly recent. Like, these are, <laughs> these are 14,500 to 11,500 years old, you know. It's during that time when incipient agriculture was beginning to start in East Asia by Homo sapiens. Mm. You know, they, they, we, they've been definitively living in this part of the world for tens of thousands of years. So you know, what on earth are we looking at here? Right. Um, so these remains have been given the name the Red Deer Cave People mm. after the English translation for the Maludong Cave. Um, and they have a mix of features seen in earlier and later humans. Again, they're very transitional. Um, so, you know, are we looking at a completely unique species or maybe just some kind of unique looking folks of our own species? You know, both of those have been proposed. Um, but most paleoanthropologists have been speculating that these fossils might represent a sort of a hybrid offspring between Homo sapiens and another species of hominin, huh. probably Denisovans. Um, of course, we would need DNA to help crack that code. Uh, but to date, you know, there has been no successful extraction. You know, this has been tried, but they haven't been able to get any DNA yet. So time will tell. Um, you know, again, you know, this is just a small sample of the many different fossils of uncertain origin from the middle to the late Pleistocene. Um, and we're not just dealing with evidence from fossils that there may be more human species left to discover. Um, Ah, uh, this is so cool. This is a study from two, uh, 2019 that examined ancient DNA evidence from a number of remains across Eurasia to try to figure out the story of human interbreeding in the, you know, for the past 60,000 years or so. Mm -hmm. Now, while some living human groups definitely contain genes from Neanderthals and or Denisovans, you know, there were some DNA signatures that didn't match either of those. Yeah. Um, in one case, about 
2.6 to 3.4 percent of the genomes of East Asian and Oceanian peoples consisted of DNA that seems to have entered their ancestral populations at a time before there was any interbreeding with Denisovans at all. Uh, the authors gave that mystery human, a very creative name, Extinct Hominin One. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, they, they speculated that, well, okay, if this predates the Denisovan interbreeding, then maybe it was residing somewhere in present-day India. You know, and they, they kind of go by a proposed direction of population expansion for Homo sapiens to accommodate that. Mm. That's a whole other topic, of course. Um, in the other case... And you know, this gets even more cool. Um, the authors examined DNA from indigenous groups in Flores, Indonesia, you know, the home of the extinct Habiline Homo floresiensis. In their DNA uh, of the Homo sapiens group, um, that DNA lies a signature that, again, it doesn't match anything known for Neanderthals or Denisovans or this extinct hominin one. Um, and, you know, the fact that this signature was found only on the island of Flores and nowhere else in this region, not in greater Indonesia, not in New Guinea, not in the Philippines, nowhere have we been able to get this signature from any ancient DNA. Wow. And, uh, or, or living DNA, for that matter. So the authors came to the conclusion that there must have been a sort of interbreeding event on the island of Flores with the ancestors of the Homo sapiens groups that currently live there. And... So now we have another unknown human who they call extinct hominin two. <laughs> um, now that particular DNA almost certainly didn't come from Homo floresiensis. Um, the authors clearly state that the originator of the DNA of both extinct hominin two and extinct hominin one lies somewhere on the Neanderthal Denisovan lineage, as you can see in the phylogeny here at the right. I have the extinct hominins highlighted in, in green. Um, so it's, yeah, that, that, that means that, you know, this lineage of humans, the Neanderthal Denisovan lineage, you know, the one to which we share a common ancestor anywhere from 800 to 500,000 years ago, was probably more extensive and more species than we previously thought. Yeah, well. You know, who on earth knows, you know, when we'll find more evidence, like fossil evidence for any of these two mystery humans, mm. um, much less all the other remains that have so far stumped us in the on the Eurasian land mass. Um, <laughs> uh, Albert, do you have anything to add? Uh, not much, but uh, I, I do remember hearing about this discovery, and yeah, it, it's incredible. Um, I, yeah, def definitely would be would be fantastic if we found uh, osteological remains of these, and if we don't actually have them already and haven't recognized it yet. <laughs> right, that's true. Um, oh, and that's the funny thing too. It's like you know which fossils match which genes. Right, um, right. Oh, it's tantalizing. It's so tantalizing. Um, but all right, let's let's uh, <laughs> let's hop over to the next slide. and let, Let's move away from all this human taxonomy mess and uh, <laughs> let's look at behavior. Now, whatever, you know, these human species are or whether Homo heidelbergensis is a thing or not, in the end, these fossils still exist. And they give us a record of hominid occupation in Eurasia, in the middle Pleistocene. So, you know, what were they like in life? You know, how do they make a living? Well, during the Middle Pleistocene, the world was still undergoing the expansion and submission of enormous ice sheets in the north and south. Um, in Eurasia, these extended southwards for hundreds of miles at points reaching into Central Europe. Um, the regions neighboring the glaciers would have been, you know, cool open grasslands or steppes, um, sparsely populated by many, any, uh, any tree species at all. Um, you know, those would have been found further south, at first in mosaic environments, and then making up slightly warmer woodlands. Uh, common game animals included elephants, you know, as well as mammoths, uh, rhinos, horses, deer of various kinds, ibex, pigs, and others. Um, plant foods, of course, abounded where people could find them. And there were notable hazards as well. You had bears, wolves, lions, hyenas, um, as well as the now extinct scimitar toothed cat, Homotherium, uh, which incidentally were related to the saber toothed cats, but they would have been more slimmer in build, and uh, the canine teeth were not nearly as big. It's a fascinating story on their own. Um, the humans who were living in Eurasia were likely not exclusive hunters. You know, you know, prey animals were highly adaptable to a number of different environments, and they seem to have 
had dispersed populations across vast ranges, only occurring in great numbers where resources were nice, you know, like river settings. And these animals weren't really forming great migratory herds either. You know, in Europe, at least, things like reindeer may, may have been seasonal visitors. Um, so, you know, it would not have been a great idea for these peoples to kind of concentrate all their attention towards just constant hunting. Mm -hmm. There would have been equally valid ways of finding meat. You know, you could scavenge carcasses of animals that didn't survive the cold, for example. Um, and gathering of plant foods, of course, probably provided the bulk of nutrients for middle Pleistocene humans, as it did for most foraging societies in human history. Now, uh, we do find tools of different kinds at these Eurasian sites. The Ashulayan technology, which was pioneered by the Erectines, uh, was continued by later Homo species in Europe. Um, this time, however, uh, there are distinctions in their form and construction, and so these have earned the name Late Acheulean. Now, this toolkit was produced using a prepared core technique called Level Lois, which is named after a site in Paris where tools of this type were first unearthed. Hmm. Basically, you take a core tool and you shape it in such a way that when you strike it with another stone, you just get flakes of exactly the dimensions you want. And it's certainly likely that, as with erectines, these stone tools had various functions, including the preparation of kills for consumption. Uh, indeed, we do find some kill sites in the archaeological record with these hand axes lying about. Now, it's with the middle Pleistocene humans that we find the first definitive evidence for things like wooden spears. Now, given the modification of the Ashulean tools with the level wall technique, now humans could get even sharper stone blades that could be used to sharpen wood into new kinds of weapons. And the best example of these are the Schoningen spears of Lower Saxony in Germany. Now, these are here at the, at the left. Uh, these are between 337,000 and 300,000 years old, and they're made from the wood of spruce trees, and they are impressive. I mean, I don't know if you can make out the scale bar in the image at the bottom left. You, you can see some of these spears are over two meters long. Um, impressive, impressive. Um, and what's interesting about them regards their shape. So at the pointed ends, the spears are at their thickest and heaviest. So what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Well, modern day javelins are built just like that. So that means that the people who made these must have thrown these spears at game, mm. right? Well, maybe. Um, there have been some experiments done on replica spears of this type, um, but these studies have given pretty mixed results, and it all should really depend on who was throwing them and how. All right. You know, the, the max distances they could get bordered on about five meters, Okay. you know, for, for a two-meter spear. Um, so like, they didn't really appear to have been able to actually penetrate hides in such a way as to, like, wound prey. Hmm. Maybe an inconvenience, at least, uh, depending on the prey animal, of course. You know, there's, there's a difference between trying to spear, like, a deer hmm. or, or a mammoth. <laughs> right, right. Um, certainly would have been different, different processes. Um, incidentally, you know, there has been much discourse about whether extinct humans, and that includes the Neanderthals, threw spears mm. or thrusted them. And much of that boils down to the details of their skeletal and muscular anatomy. Um, that is to say, could these humans physically and accurately throw a spear at all? Well, while these humans had the capacity to rotate their shoulder joints in such a way as to raise their arms high, you know, they don't appear to have been able to make the sort of gestures needed to throw a spear like a javelin. Hmm. Um, it's possible that wooden spears like these may have been multi-purpose. You know, depending on the size, some of them were, were used for thrusting into prey of a certain type, and others may have been, you know, been thrown uh, at, again, prey of another type. Um, now, these particular spears were found associated with a mass of dead horses. So it seems safe to conclude that these spears were effective in taking them down, mm. however they were used. Um, and similar sites across Eurasia lay bare the evidence that, you know, humans from 500,000 years ago and on were engaging in big game hunts. You know, they were taking down prey as big as elephants and killing lots of them. So we're a long way from the persistence hunters 
of Homo erectus mm -hmm. and certainly a long way from the you know, um, opportunistic scavenging of Homo habilis in the Australopithecines. Now, we also find tools constructed from bone at Middle Pleistocene sites. Uh, Bill Singh Slaben in Thuringia, Germany, dates back around 350,000 years ago. And the humans here were taking elephant bones and flaking them with stone tools into scrapers and choppers. So perhaps relying on material that was delicate enough for certain types of work. Uh, a lot of these authors have speculated that these bone tools were used for scraping at skins, for example. Uh, which brings us to an interesting question of when clothing shows up in the human story. And that is very tricky. Definitive evidence of things like sewing and hemming appears in the archaeological record associated with Homo sapiens. And that's thousands of years after these middle Pleistocene sites. However, given the sheer cold in places like Europe during these ice ages, you know, there doesn't seem to have been any reasonable way for humans to have survived without good clothes, mm. unless they were just, you know, ridiculously hairy, <laughs> which you know, that, that, that's a bit of a discourse too. Right. Um, we know that, ne that you know, species like Neanderthals were harvesting skins and hides from prey animals and preparing them. Um, many skulls even have worn down front teeth where they would hold on to the, uh, the hides with their mouths and then just kind of scrape downwards with their stone tools, creating wear. Um, so to take the next step and, you know, create warm fitting clothes, I think that would have been fairly easy. Mm -hmm. you know, in general, you know, there likely wasn't one time and place where clothing was invented, but rather it would have happened multiple times across different human species. Um, and of course, we, we can't rule out that even though we don't find things like bone needles at Neanderthal sites, that maybe they were, you know, sewing clothes using another strategy mm -hmm. or in a different way. Um, again, it, the evidence remains to be seen. Now, moving away from clothing to construction, we increasingly find evidence of various settlements among humans in the middle Pleistocene of Eurasia. So, you know, what was, what was home sweet home for an Ice Age human? Well, you know, I'll go ahead and get this out of the way right now. You know, caves, honestly, would probably have been used as homes by Ice Age people, hmm. um, but they wouldn't have been the only types of dwellings. You know, of course, we find all sorts of human remains in caves, you know, with evidence of extended activity. So, I mean, they were certainly living in them. Hmm. And, and you know what, why not? You know, a, a cave with a, a nice flaming hearth, that makes a really good refuge from poor weather, not to mention animals that, you know, wouldn't mind tasting you. All right. <laughs> but, you know, we, we do also have remains of other types of homes. Uh, for example, you can see in the artwork by yours truly hmm. at the top right, you know, humans were constructing dwellings out of rocks and wood. At Presletis in the Czech Republic, and my goodness, is it hard to get a good pronunciation for Czech words, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, are the remains of just such a structure around 700,000 years ago. It's located by a river site. Uh, the home was a four by three. It was framed by sticks of an unknown height that may or may not have been bolted at the top and secured by a ring of rocks. Uh, you know, it was big enough for a small hearth and a few sleeping areas. So it's unlikely that, you know, people hung out inside for great periods of time unless they really needed to, you know, like during a really good blizzard. Um, and other sites include mixed features. So uh, Le Lazare Cave in France, uh, which was built between 186 and 127,000 years ago, that seems to be constructed of a series of large wooden sticks that were pitched across the opening of a cave hmm. so that if they, they were using sticks to make sort of a wall. Um, and the researchers at this site have gone even as far as to suggest that based on the small seashells that were found deposited all across the floor of this home, um, humans were actually bringing in great amounts of seaweed from the coasts to make beds to sleep on. Wow. Now, it's, it's hard to say for certain whether that's the case. But, uh, you know, in sites like these, you know, they, they attest to the ingenuity that middle Pleistocene humans had. Mm -hmm. We're starting to see more complex behavior than anything beforehand. And, you know, it, it's that sort of ingenuity that was inherited by their possible descendants, the Neanderthals. And so now we're going to finally meet this sister species of ours hmm. on the next slide. So this is Homo neanderthalensis. 
Now, the name Neanderthal, sometimes pronounced Neanderthal, uh, I, I tend to prefer the former, hmm. um, comes from the Neanderthal Valley in North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany. It was there in 1856 that a, the skull cap of an adult Neanderthal was unearthed inside a limestone cave. Now, this type specimen, which is called Neanderthal 1, can be seen in the image here at the left. Now, the reconstructed skeleton to the right, that represents over a century and a half of archaeological work that has today brought us over 500 different Neanderthal discoveries. And that includes about 20 or more complete skeletons of various ages and sexes. Uh, to date, you know, the Neanderthals were probably one of the best known of all extinct hominins, going all the way back to Sahelanthropus. This is like, we, the amount of information we've been able to get on the Neanderthals is insane and amazing. Now, if we focus on the traditional or classic type Neanderthals, as mentioned previously, then we get an archaeological record going back about 250,000 years ago, and then ceasing roughly 40,000 years ago, give or take a few thousand. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, if we consider the Adipuerca finds to be Neanderthals themselves of an early variety, well, then the temporal range would probably be extended at least 430,000 years ago or more. Mm -hmm. Again, that remains to be seen. Now, thanks to the advances in genetics research, you know, we now have ancient DNA samples from quite a number of Neanderthals that have been studied extensively, and so much so that in 2013, the Neanderthal Genome Project actually managed to successfully publish the first complete genome of an individual that lived in Siberia about 130,000 years ago. And, you know, that is really amazing, I think. Indeed, yeah. So uh, let's, let's jump to the next slide. Uh, Neanderthals co-evolved alongside our own species, and they shared much in common with us. Uh, in terms of cranial capacity, Neanderthal brains were of a very similar size to those of Homo sapiens, uh, if only a little bit larger in general. Mm. Uh, they range somewhere between 100, uh, 1,200 and 1,750 cc's. Um, you know, that, of course, amounts to the uh, change in brain size for our own species, which seems to have actually shrunk a bit over the past tens of thousands of years. And more on that in the next episode. Um, now, I, I'm personally not really interested in comparing intelligence. <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, the fact that Neanderthals have survived for about as long as we have is a pretty good sign that they knew what they were doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, there are some differences in proportion between certain parts of the brain that researchers have noted. Uh, the parts of the brain responsible for things like vision and bodily control were larger, while much of the areas devoted to memory, decision-making, and social behaviors were a bit smaller than those of Homo sapiens. Mm. And uh, this all likely means that, you know, Neanderthal societies operated on maybe slightly different wavelengths compared to those of our species. Mm -hmm. um, but again, the sample size for our species is quite vast. So uh, I hesitate to speculate too wildly on this. Right. Um, but, you know, others have done so anyway. But again, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and save this discussion for the next episode. Now, because Neanderthals lived for such a long time and on a fairly large range, you know, they seem to have also shared a diverse phenotype with us. Uh, DNA studies have clued researchers in that certain individuals had light pigmented skin, while others had dark pigmented skin. Hmm. Some had dark hair colors, some had light hair colors, and perhaps a few out of the total population actually had red hair. Now, uh, this is in contrast to a widely shared factoid that, you know, most Neanderthals were gingers. Oh, right. Um, but, you know, the genes for red hair aren't even that common in Homo sapiens, mm -hmm. so that probably wasn't the case. Um, what is really neat, though, is that similar studies indicate that the ancestors of some present-day humans, for example, folks in Europe, might have actually inherited certain phenotypic traits from Neanderthals following interbreeding. Mm. Now, when we move towards the skeletal anatomy, well, you know, that's when the differences become apparent. You know, pretty much any paleoanthropologist knows when a fossil comes from a Neanderthal instead of, say, a member of Homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. you, know, you recall my comments about the skull shape in this lineage. Neanderthals had heads that were longer and more robust than ours. The forehead was much lower. Uh, they had a great brow ridge over the eyes, and the, the back of the skull actually protruded. This is known as a occipital bun, 
although uh, I don't think that that's exclusive to Neanderthals. You know, other human species had it. And among some individuals today, you know, it still occurs. Now, their jaws were a bit pragmatic. You know, that, that is to say they, they jutted out a bit. Um, but their chins weren't as protruding as ours. Mm -hmm. um, Homo sapiens seems to have kind of gotten its chin game rather strong, as you can see, yep. comparing the skulls on the left here. Um, their noses were bigger than ours, uh, although contrary to a popular hypothesis that you might have heard, uh, where Neanderthal noses were so large because they would warm up the cool air mm. as they breathed in Ice Age Europe, that actually doesn't seem very likely. Um, those particularly adapted to cool conditions appear to have convergently evolved their noses in the same way that living Arctic peoples have. You know, their nose is adapted to breathe in cool air, not warm it up before breathing it in. Hmm. Now, if we look at the postcranial skeleton, well, you're immediately made aware of the robustness and form. Uh, Neanderthals typically had shorter limbs than those of Homo sapiens, um, but they were much more muscular in build with very large joints that gave the arms and the legs much of the same mobility and flexibility that we have. But as we've seen in our discussion about spear throwing, maybe not fully the same as ours. <laughs> um, Neanderthals would have made great runners, you know, for the types of hunting that they needed to do. Um, but they likely weren't endurance runners like many earlier and later human species. Um, the rib cage is wider as it descends and it points towards a wider hip than ours, um, which seems to have been a bit of an ancestral trait for earlier hominins that still work perfectly well for this species. And there's many more features than that. But let's go ahead and move on now to the next slide into the wider world of the Neanderthals. And here we see a species that was very adaptable to a wide range of environments. Um, archaeological sites have been found widely across Europe, from Iberia to Romania, down south into the Levant and near Mesopotamia, and eastward across the Black and Caspian Seas towards Siberia. Now, there are currently no known fossils of Neanderthals in northern Africa, but given that they lived a mere hop and a skip away from that continent, it's totally reasonable to speculate that they at least ventured further south on occasion. Mm -hmm. um, incidentally, a study just came out within the last week that might give some insights into this. So to explain, uh, there's a toolkit called the Nubian that is commonly found in Northeast Africa and across the Red Sea into the Levant and the present day United A Arab Emirates. Uh, previously, the presence of these tools and their marked similarities to each other have been interpreted as evidence of Homo sapiens dispersals between Africa and Southwest Asia. As indeed, these tools were usually associated with our species in the first place. But this recent study concerns a site in the Palestinian West Bank where some Nubian tools were found alongside an isolated molar tooth. Now, to find stone tools so closely aligned with human remains is always great luck because, you know, that means we can be more confident of attribution to a particular species than is normally the case for a lot of these stone tool technologies. And it was revealed that it was a Neanderthal that was using these Nubian tools, mm -hmm. meaning that now this toolkit was no longer exclusive to Homo sapiens. And the implications of here are, are fascinating. You know, maybe much of the Nubian toolkit in Southwest Asia and into Africa was crafted by Neanderthals. Mm. Or maybe this is evidence of a sapiens Neanderthal trade or a right. cultural exchange of some sort. Um, you know, these, these are all questions to investigate in due time. Mm. Now, I should make clear that the overall distribution of the Neanderthals range did change over the course of the species evolution. Um, based on the fossil data that we have, it seems that Neanderthals were originally a north to central Eurasian species for much of their early history until about 70 to 50,000 years ago when they began extending their range into Southwest Asia. Now, in different parts of their range, Neanderthals exhibited some regional diversity um, with individuals in, say, the Mediterranean showing more similarities to each other than to those in Northern Europe. And uh, one 2009 study went so far as to propose that Neanderthals could be actually divided into at least three regional groups, maybe four. Um, but probably the biggest takeaway from this study, uh, rather than these, so, um, these regional differences, is that 
the Neanderthal species seems to have exhibited a tendency for certain populations in a given region to interact more with each other than with those of other groups. And that really has some implications for population history, as I'll discuss towards the end of this episode. Mm -hmm. Now, while Neanderthals appear to have been highly adaptable humans, they would have had environmental restrictions that affected them across the generations. You know, many paleoanthropologists have argued that Neanderthals likely avoided the cold, dry steppe tundra that bordered the Great Ice Sheets, mm. you know, only going there to hunt certain prey animals or just because they were under pressure to do so. Um, they see Neanderthals instead as more at home in mosaic environments or, or strictly woodlands. Um, and indeed, there is environmental evidence from several sites that indicate that you know, they frequently made their homes there you know, by resource rich places like riversides or, or valleys. Um, and you know what? They were even more comfortable out by the sea. Mm. They, they made use of coastal animals and plants for their livelihoods too. Now, their range in places like Europe was likely punctuated by the growth and retreat of the ice sheets as it was for earlier human species. So when the glaciers expanded, they would have moved southwards and vice versa. Right. Um, so yeah, there can be no doubt that the Neanderthals were highly flexible, at least. So let's move to the next slide now, um, to aspects of their technology. We have at least one tool technology that has been generally associated with Neanderthals, and that's the European Mousterium. Now, this is named after the site of Les Moustiers in France, where these tools were first unearthed. And they represent a further development on the late Achoulain level law technique. Um, but it should be clarified, at least, that the Mousterian in total is also known from Northern Africa, but based on nearby fossils, these appear to have been utilized by early forms of Homo sapiens before undergoing the dramatic change that underpinned the African Middle Stone Age, which I'll cover in the next episode. Now, the Mousterian toolkit consists of flakes, scrapers, and pointers, uh, which were expertly sharpened by the level wa technique. These scrapers would have been very effective for cutting through flesh for consumption or for preparing skin and hide for clothing. Uh, the points, it seems, were attached to wooden spears, giving us the first definitive evidence of composite tools uh, in the archeological record. Uh, wood seems to have been a common resource for Neanderthals. And based on the wear and polish of some of these stone tools, it actually seems that there was a, a lot of woodwork going on uh, you know, for making spears, but also for constructing drillings, which we do have evidence for. Now, what's really neat about the construction of these composite spheres, um, it turns out, is that we find Neanderthals the first humans ever to use adhesive materials. So, yeah, Neanderthals were the first to invent glue. <laughs> wow. <laughs> they, would, uh, they would seek out birch trees, and they would peel off the bark, as it's easy to do, and they would warm it over a fire until it became kind of soft and malleable, like, like a paste. Right. And they would take that and apply it to the carved head of a wooden shaft and then stick a Mousterian point on top of it and uh, wait for it to dry. Mm. And researchers have been able to extract microscopic residues from preserved tools and figure out that this was going on in the first place. Um, which incidentally is also aided by ethnographic work from traditional societies that engaged in much the same behavior as the Neanderthals did. Now, I'm obliged to make mention of the Shadow Peronian toolkit which is only dated 45 to 40,000 years ago, which is at the tail end of the Neanderthal's existence. It's also named after a site in France, Châtel Peron, and it's become quite a controversial toolkit for a number of reasons. Hmm. Uh, it's unlike the Mousterian and earlier toolkits in that it consists of very small blades and other fine tools, as well as some decorative objects. Uh, and these have previously not been found associated with Neanderthal sites. And so many archaeologists were a bit suspicious about them. Um, the, some of them argue that these tools just couldn't have been made by Neanderthals on their own, um, but that they were aided by recently arriving Homo sapiens groups into Europe, which typically is associated with small blade-like toolkits. Mm. Now, others say that the Shadow Peronian isn't even a real toolkit at all. Um, it's an artifact of mixed sediment layers from two different sites, one occupied by Neanderthals and one occupied by uh, European Homo sapiens. And still others have argued that all this discourse is just based on assumptions that Neanderthals just 
couldn't make the sorts of sapiens like tools that mm-hmm. we can and that in reality there's no reason to say so you know after all you know we're finding that neanderthals shared a lot of so-called advanced cultures and technologies with early homo sapiens mm-hmm. so it's totally possible that neanderthals crafted the shuttle peronian all on their own um so as you can see the discourse is still very strong um and this is further impacted by a greater abundance of shadow pronian sites than we had previously. Oh, right, right. In the meantime, it looks like there's no concrete answer at all as to what these tools are hmm. and who they belong to. Um, so let's jump to the next slide. Um, you know, in, in discussing Neanderthal tools and weapons, of course, it becomes obvious that meat was a part of their diet. I mean, otherwise they wouldn't be crafting composite spears to bring down things like horses and deer and mammoths. Hmm. Some researchers have gone as far as to suggest that Neanderthals were actually apex predators, mm-hmm. or that they were proper carnivores, where you know where meat consists of most, if not all, of their diet. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, looking at the total evidence, we know that that is not true. Uh, Neanderthals seem to have had the wide range of diets that Homo sapiens has enjoyed during its evolution. For one thing, Neanderthals were they like they were big game hunters, but they were also going after small game too. Mm-hmm. Um, we have evidence at several sites that these hunters were catching and eating tortoises, rabbits, beavers, songbirds, uh, raptors, doves, and quails, mm. as well as the eggs of some of these species. Um, the fact that flying birds made up a part of their diet says a lot about the capabilities of Neanderthals Indeed. as hunters and trappers. You know, uh, even with the evidence uh, being uncertain about their throwing abilities, you know, there are many ways of catching an animal as nimble as a bird you know as you can see in the art in the uh, ethnographic record and in everyday life um, in fact in her recent book kindred um, which has been an absolutely tremendous resource for this episode so giving a shout out to rebecca sykes um, she mentions that choffs which are members of the corvidae mm-hmm. um, they often visit alpine ski resorts to go after human waste which at that point well it's only a matter of ambush for the NFL at close range mm-hmm. you know Leave some garbage out, birds come, food, you know? Mm-hmm. Now, um, one of the most ingenious bird trap techniques that I've ever heard of comes from an account from one of my favorite vintage anthropology books. And this is Rolf Linton's The Tree of Culture. Um, just word of warning ahead, uh, this might be a little bit graphic, um, but I'll go ahead and read the text right now uh, verbatim so you can see what I'm talking about. <clears throat> One of the most amusing traps I ever encountered was in use in Madagascar. It is also used in many parts of Africa. I was traveling through the open belt country in the southwestern part of Madagascar and saw a ring of clay about six to eight inches across and about one inch high, modeled on a flat rock. My native bears explained that this was a trap for catching guinea fowl. Some ground nuts, which are like peanuts except that the kernels are larger, rounder, and harder, were put inside the circle which served to keep them from rolling off the rock. The kernels were a little too big for the guinea fowl to actually pick up, but they would keep on trying. Every time a guinea hen picked at one and missed, its beak came down on the rock. As guinea fowl are persistent creatures, they would keep this up until their heads swelled up and they went blind. Every day or so, the owner of the trap would come and hunt through the brush near the trap and pick up the disabled birds. This may be hard to believe, but any poultry raiser knows that the same thing can happen to chickens when they are fed on a concrete floor. Now, <laughs> take a scenario like that and run it any way you like. You know, maybe the nuts could be stuck onto a slab of that dried pitch bark. You know, we, we don't have physical remains of traps at Neanderthal archaeological sites, mm-hmm. but the fact that we find bones from these small animals heavily implies that they were using them. Now, prey wasn't confined to the land either. Uh, We already know that Neanderthals also occupied coastal areas, and we have evidence that they were also utilizing marine animals as food. Now, the larger leftmost image at the right shows a sample of mollusk and barnacle remains from a site in Malaga in Spain, uh, which was the first such site of its kind to reveal a seafood diet for Neanderthals. Uh, since then, similar fights, uh, similar sites have also uh, been found, and they brought up the remains of dolphins, seals, uh, various open ocean fishes like tuna, uh, crabs, and sea urchins. Now, while beachcombing and scavenging 
can be ruled out. I mean, it's, it's a very convenient way to get food after all. Mm -hmm. um, there was a really neat study from last year that found unusual bone growth inside the ear canals of Neanderthals that were found at a site in Italy that was by the coast. And it was consistent with those found in modern day skin divers. Hmm. So that is to say that the Neanderthals who lived there were actually deep diving into the water and collecting their meals. Wow. And that is awesome. To, so it, it kind of goes to show the importance of using different areas of study to mm -hmm. find results. I mean, who would think to look into the ears of deep divers to find out about Neanderthals, oh, right? Right, right. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, now, moving away from the animal kingdom, you know, we do see evidence that Neanderthals were eating plant foods of several kinds, as well as mushrooms, um, not only from archaeological sites, but also by removing calculus from the teeth mm -hmm. of Neanderthal skulls and then doing DNA studies that way. Now, based on these uh, results, uh, we find that Neanderthals were gathering grasses, digging up tubers, picking fruits of various kinds from flowering trees, uh, collecting conifer nuts, and they were even eating moss. Now, plants and fungi as medicines have been used by sapien societies for tens of thousands of years. And there is a growing understanding that Neanderthals shared this form of knowledge too. I mean, there are all sorts of ailments and hazards that can affect you in the Pleistocene of Eurasia. Mm -hmm. And there are a sizable number of Neanderthal remains that show really nasty injuries to parts of their skeletons. I mean, you got individuals with cracked skulls, fractured limbs, broken ribs, for example. Mm -hmm. And there's a bit of discourse about how these people got their injuries in the first place. Now, a common suggestion regards their hunting lifestyles. Right. You know, the uh, paleoanthropologists who follow the hypothesis that Neanderthals weren't great at throwing spears, but instead had to thrust them at prey, well, then many of these injuries could be the result of the need to get really close to big game during hunts, um, which if that's the case, well, that's certainly a scary way to get your food. I mean, uh, I, I can't imagine a group of people going up to a mammoth and trying to hunt it that way. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, that's, that's power right there. Um, but others see evidence of interpersonal violence. And, you know, there are a few cases where certain injuries only make sense when viewed as a series of continuous blows by a hard weapon. Now, of course, that's not to say that Neanderthals were warlike or engaged in warfare in the first place. I mean, th there's no evidence for that. Um, it could just be, you know, personal squabbles, as is usually the case in many traditional forager societies. Um, and, you know, other researchers see these wounds as the result of encounters with other predatory animals, mm -hmm. you know, uh, wolves and cave bears competing for resources or just, you know, a bad encounter in the woods one day. Now, you know, whatever the causes, Neanderthal injuries seem to match up closely with those of prehistoric Homo sapiens remains. And so that might help us in the search for answers, as more researchers are trying to do. Now, that many of these skeletons showed signs of healing, it seems obvious that while well, these injured Neanderthals were being looked after by their families. Mm -hmm. And you know, a good way to help heal injuries, or at least numb the pain, is with medicinal plants and fungi. Mm -hmm. um, so if you see in the smaller images at the bottom left, I show two examples of plants that were used by Levantine Neanderthals in medicine. On the left are acorns from the Lebanon oak tree, and on the right are leaves from a grapevine. There was a 2005 study that showed that these, among other plant species, uh, have been used in medicine for much of the history of Homo sapiens in that region. And so their presence at Neanderthal sites is very telling. Uh, oak acorns, you know, provided they're soaked in water to remove their toxins, you know, they can be ground into a paste and used as an antiseptic. Um, the leaves of grapevine, when they're ingested, can actually help reduce pain and swelling in the legs as a result of a, a venous insufficiency. So, you know, just like traditional Homo sapien societies, you know, Neanderthals would have had an expert knowledge of their local flora and fauna, what was good for food and what was good for medicine. Uh, before moving on, uh, I, I do need to kind of give a little note on cannibalism. Mm. So, yeah, it's a thing. Uh, many human societies engaged in the eating of other humans on rare occasions. You know, sometimes the victims were prisoners of war. Other times it was ceremonial. 
you know, honoring a, a loved one who had died. Um, there's a number of sites that seem to show Neanderthals preparing dead bodies in the same way that animal carcasses were done for food. Hmm. So like the limbs are meticulously defleshed, for example. Um, however, other researchers have drawn different conclusions, seeing these particular examples as evidence of predation by animals. So maybe it, it just looks like it was cannibalized, but instead it was, you know, a hyena munching down on something. Hmm. Uh, but at the moment, the issue is inconclusive. But cannibalism would not be out of the range of possibilities for Neanderthals, as rare as it probably would have been. Mm -hmm. So let's move to the next slide here. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to kind of end our Neanderthal discussion by diving into the world of cultural anthropology, or rather archaeology, and what it reveals about culture. And uh, I'm going to say outright that there's probably a lot about Neanderthal culture that we're never going to know. Mm -hmm. The fact that we've been able to find so much and provide well-informed speculation is exciting on its own. Now, seeing as I've already spent you know time going over stone toolkits, you know there are other known technologies that the Neanderthals pioneered. So, just to name a few, uh, there were particular marks on the teeth of Neanderthals uh, from the site in Croatia that revealed that these people had constructed toothpicks to clean their teeth after a meal. Um, especially, you know, as, as, as a form of dentistry. You know, this might sound strange. Um, and, you know, there is this popular notion that early humans were just dirty and gross all the time, you know, because they didn't have bathrooms. But right. actually, there's a lot of information in historical and ethnographic records that complicates this picture. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, people in forger societies usually had fairly healthier teeth than those of agricultural ones because, you know, they were eating a more diverse diet than just a, a handful of starches. Um, although, I mean, there were cases of forager groups that heavily relied on wild starches, and so they got cavities too. Mm. And of course, you know, there's all sorts of archaeological evidence of dentistry in various groups, you know, people carefully knocking out bad teeth, you know, uh, castaway style, and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that doesn't seem out of the realm of, that doesn't seem out of the realm of possibility for Neanderthals. Um, they also seem to have had knowledge of fibers and weaving. And this comes primarily from two lines of evidence. Uh, the first concerns a site in Abri du Marat in France, where a series of twisted fibers made from bark was unearthed alongside stone tools. Now, one of these fibers was three plot, uh, which means that multiple fibers were intertwined together. This sort of evidence tends to kind of wither away under the usual conditions of time, you know, Things like uh, baskets and nets and ropes have not been found for Neanderthals. But if the evidence is clear that they were weaving fiber, well, then the possibility of finding this technology is at least likely. Um, and you know, the second line of evidence for their use of fibers leads us into the world of aesthetics for a little bit. Hmm. Um, there are a number of shell and bone pieces from different sites that show that Neanderthals could make jewelry. Uh, one site in Caprina, Croatia, shows a series of dismembered talons from a white-tailed eagle uh, yep. uh, that have been modeled in a way that suggests that they were kind of strung up on a fiber. Um, and there's an image of them in the center here. And the authors of that study suggest that these may have been part of a, a necklace or maybe even a bracelet, but we don't know that for sure. In any case, like they were clearly strung up and worn somehow. Um, and there's another site, at uh, this time, a uh, Kieva Anton in Spain that shows a scallop shell, among mm. other mullet species, uh, with clear puncture marks on their sides right. for putting fibers through. And I have an image of one of those here at the left. Now, jewelry is very telling because it provides obvious evidence that Neanderthals were decorating themselves in much the same ways that early Homo sapiens were. Um, they were making use of red ochre paints, uh, applying them to their jewelry and possibly onto their bodies. And they were also selecting the primary feathers from eagles and crows and seemingly using them in a decorative manner. Mm. I've actually seen some reconstructions that show Neanderthals wearing them as kind of feathers in their hair. Right, right. Kind of like you see in some like Native American dress. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, who knows? Maybe they were sewing them onto their clothes or maybe there's something else that was going on. Right. Now, this next, this next technology has some really big implications. Um, Mousterian tools have been uncovered from several islands in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, most notably Crete, uh, 
and some of them go back about 130,000 years. But even taking into account the high glacial periods soaking up so much of the seawater that they drop sea levels, there was never a time when islands like Crete were connected to mainland Europe. Hmm. So the most logical conclusion that many researchers have argued is that Neanderthals, who may have been the makers of these tools, actually constructed watercraft and populated those islands during sea voyages. Oh, wow. Now, if that's the case, and the tools you know, do belong to Neanderthals and not, say, North African Homo sapiens, because mm-hmm. remember, they made Mousterian tools too, well, then who's to say that this species wasn't making boats elsewhere? You know, maybe they actually did kind of cross the Straits of Gibraltar into Africa and met up with their own species. Wow. Who knows on who knows on that route? Um, now let's uh, let's go back to aesthetics for a bit. There's been a lot of discourse about whether Neanderthals made art, and since we find aesthetic imagery as far back as those shell marks made by the Javan Homo erectus, then it seems reasonable to conclude that later humans inherited this practice. I mean, after all, evidence for early art in Homo sapiens abounds, as we'll see in later episodes. So. You know, what do we have for Neanderthals? Well, Gorham's cave in Gibraltar offers one possible example. Uh, Deeply cut hatch marks on the floor of the cave, predating the extinction of Neanderthals in this area of the world, have been brought forth as evidence of Neanderthal art. Um, Now, these must have taken a lot of work to create. Hmm. Uh, Researchers estimate that it took between 200 and 300 passes with the stone tool to get such low marks wow. and in a particular sequence too, to create sort of a hashtag as, <laughs> a, as is known in popular news stories. Um, now this does match with aesthetic marks from other human species. So it's fairly conceivable that this was the result of Neanderthal handiwork. Um, but there's an even more controversial aesthetic work that can be found at some sites in Spain, uh, caves that date to about um, over 64,000 years old. Um, and it's because, you know, of that particular date for these caves, or the remains in these caves, I should say, um, that researchers have proposed that the artworks in those caves were made by Neanderthals um, because there's no record of Homo sapiens in that region 64,000 years ago. Um, so what we have are a series of various handprints and stencils There are animal depictions, um, and there are also geometric shapes, as well as lines. Um, And they were made with a red pigment and placed along the walls and along spelio themes, so uh, stalagmites. Um, Now, if Neanderthals were making images like this, well, then it only adds to the mounting evidence of their similarities to us. Mm -hmm. Um, But it turns out, you know, not so fast. (laughs) Um, The reason there's such a discourse on this is that the date that was given by these researchers might be off um, because, you know, the conditions of the caves may have given them faulty dates. Mm, right. I mean, dating sites in caves is very tricky, if you remember. Um, so paleoanthropologists who have called the site into question argue that, you know, these images are actually much younger than they appear and therefore more likely attributed to Homo sapiens. Now, uh, we'll have to wait for more work to be done on the caves before we, you know, have a final verdict. But, I mean, personally, I don't see why Neanderthals couldn't have made something like this. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe it was just one group out of all of them experimenting with this sort of aesthetics. But, you know, who knows, right? Um, now, uh, we find another curious instance of, ne- of possible aesthetics in the fact that there is actually evidence that Neanderthals were collecting crystals. Oh, wow. <laughs> mostly quartzes. Um, yeah, uh, we have no idea why they were doing this. Um, <laughs> I, I, I lump these under aesthetics because you know, it, it might be that Neanderthals just picked these crystals up, thought they were pretty, and brought them home. Yeah, I mean, it's no different than you know finding a cool rock on the ground and putting it in your pocket. You know, right? Kind of like that, right? <laughs> um, now I know what some of you may be thinking, uh, and yeah, I wouldn't toss aside the possibility that Neanderthals believed in healing crystals. <laughs> Um, you know, that stuff seems like new age hoo-ha, but I mean, it, it, it goes all the way back to the Sumerians. Right, right. But, you know, why not earlier than that? <laughs> <laughs> now, speaking of beliefs, you know, uh, here's another, uh, yet another discourse in the Neanderthal <laughs> world. Um, you know, this concerns the practice of burying the dead. Now, let's start with a basic observation. 
you know, there are a number of sites across Europe and Southwest Asia that show individual Neanderthals preserved in fetal positions with folded arms, either on their sides or on their backs. Um, some of these individuals have objects alongside them, while others are sprinkled with pollen samples. Mm. And these indicate that they were maybe surrounded by flowers, um, but there's discourse there. Um, some of these sites show fairly young individuals and others, you know, with much older individuals. So you know, what, what, what do these sites mean? You know, do they show that Neanderthals deliberately and perhaps ritually buried their dead, sometimes with grave goods? You know, did they understand death? You know, did they have a belief in the afterlife? So the origin and evolution of religion is an enormous topic. And it's one that I'd like to save for a later episode. Mm. But I mean, when you discuss the Neanderthals, you kind of ha- you know, have to bring it up. All right. um, some paleoanthropologists have on occasion hypothesized that their particular hominin finds represent a ritual burial. Um, most recently, Lee Berger and colleagues, you know, who argued that the Homo naledi remains in the Rising Star Caves were put there on purpose. Mm. And they wasn't just, you know, oops, I fell down or got trapped in the cave and died there, mm. you know? Um, yeah, we don't actually know when supernatural beliefs, you know, like one of the afterlife, originated in hominins. You know, whether it happened at once or at multiple times in different species. I mean... Uh, the understanding of death is l- at least a little bit easier to understand. Um, we have pretty compelling cases that chimps have emotionally strong reactions to the deaths of their fellows. Um, so you, a, a death in a hominin community was probably a very dramatic event for all related individuals. Um, but you know how they responded afterward is really tricky to know. Some researchers have looked at these apparent burials, and they don't see ritual so much as a purposeful means of disposing a body mm. to keep it from rotting or attracting predatory animals to your home. Um, and you know what? Maybe that was the case. I mean, it might even be that some Neanderthals ritually buried their deceased and others just wanted to put a stinky dead body away. Mm. Um, or, you know, it may be that these burials are a red herring. Uh, maybe the Neanderthals took care of their dead in completely different ways. Um, we can't know for sure. Mm-hmm. Um I personally think, considering what we know about Neanderthals and how, again, how similar they were to us already, you know, maybe there might be something to the idea of ritual burials. Right. As my friend Dr. Adam Johnson, who is also an anthropologist, has just pointed out, you know, we don't really see these types of burials from other hominins previously. Right. You know, they're only associated with Neanderthals and with Homo sapiens, and that alone should be a clear sign that something new was going on in the human story. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is, you know, a lot to some of these sites that give pretty big hints of ritual burial. Um, you know, how the soil was dug up, uh, how uh, the researchers saw that some of the burials showed no signs of scavenging animals um, or geologic disturbance for that matter. Um, the placement of the burials in certain parts of the caves and on and on. Um, the evidence is far from conclusive, but I, I wouldn't deny the possibility that Neanderthals not only buried their dead ritually, but they had unique beliefs about death too mm-hmm. um and you know and it's in terms of ritual you know what about that famous cave bear cult you know, some of you uh, in our audience who have some age on you might remember reading or hearing about you know some sites where neanderthals placed a bunch of cave bear skulls in a specific row inside caves as part of some ritual religious practice that has long since disappeared mm-hmm. well it turns out that entire thing is probably not true no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I know i literally just made the case that, you know that i believe in neanderthal beliefs but mm. i mean this particular case has has been thoroughly debunked um it turns out that the rows of cave bear skulls are artifacts of natural processes i mean the bears went into these caves died somehow and were just preserved together in a way that made it look like they were placed there mm. by neanderthals um, again, that's not to say that they couldn't have had cult-like beliefs about cave bears, but you know those specific sites with those specific interpretations have been discredited. All right. So there's the word on that. <laughs> <laughs> now let's go ahead to the next slide here and shift focus now to the Neanderthals' closest known relatives, mm. the Denisians. Um, I, I still remember when the news about these humans was announced back in 2010. Mm. Um, 
I mean, I was in high school and I was just fascinated that the thought that, oh, you can discover an entirely new species by just sequencing DNA from a minuscule fragment of one finger bone. <laughs> right. It's incredible. You know, science. Woo! <laughs> um, but, you know, since that time, archaeologists have unearthed a, a tiny number of other Denisovan remains, mostly from the site of Denisova Cave in Russia, where they got their name, um, with the exception of the Jahe Mandible. And this is shown here at the top right. Uh, that was discovered at the uh, Bashia Cave in Tibet. Now, as far as anatomy is concerned, there is not a lot to go off of. Mm -hmm. uh, that the Neanderthals um, and the Nisivans were close relatives is pretty important. You know, maybe they looked fairly similar to each other. Uh, now, if you look at the Shahe mandible, um, you can see that it's a pretty big jaw. It's really robust in features. And the researchers have noted that, you know, while it does share a few of those robust traits with Neanderthals, uh, most of it is distinct. I mean, for one thing, the, the, the molar teeth are massive. We haven't found anything like that for Neanderthals or Homo sapiens. So there was a notable study from 2019 that analyzed Denisovan DNA to try to uncover possible phenotypic traits based on a process called DNA methylation. So you compare the changes in Denisovan DNA with those of Neanderthals, as well as chimpanzees. And the reason you do that is, for, well, for, for the latter two, is that you can kind of see how accurate this method is at uncovering physical features. Mm -hmm. So like, oh, the, the, here's a gene that works towards um, a certain hair color for chimps. Uh, does this hair color match what we see in chimps? Oh, yes, it does. Um, and so you can say that, okay, this is a pretty reliable way to test that particular gene. Um, and so... Spoiler alert, it, it worked pretty well. Um, and so, you know, what does this tell us about uh, Denisovans and what they look like? Well, you know, yeah, they looked a lot like Neanderthals in many respects. Um, their skulls and jaws may have been a little bit larger in overall size, um, but they still had, you know, the long, low skull shape and the wide bodies of Neanderthals. And uh, there have also been other DNA studies that have given us a little bit more information, you know, suggesting that at least some Denisovans had dark skin and brown hair. Um, but it's possible given their range across Eurasia that they may have been as diverse in features as the Neanderthals were. So, you know, what do we have about culture or technology for that matter? Again, you know, we have minimal clues. I mean, alongside the remains at the knees of the cave are Mousterian-like tools that were crafted in the level law technique. So, you know, it's very likely that, you know, they hunted much the same prey animals and gathered the same plant foods as Neanderthals. Um, but beyond that, it's anybody's guess. I mean, I imagine they were probably as culturally complex as Neanderthals, mm. um, you know, which says a lot because Neanderthal cultures seem to have been on par with our own. Um, DNA studies have also suggested that Denisovans, like Neanderthals and living Homo sapiens today, seem to have had such extensive ranges that regional groups with particular genes had evolved at least three times across Eurasia. Um, the Nisimans had a pretty good run through the Pleistocene. Um, the DNA sequences and stratigraphic data that we have tells us that they lived between at least 217,000 and 51,600 years ago, mm. although they were probably around much earlier than the former date, um, at least before you know 430,000 years ago when the Atacarca humans diverged from their Neanderthal relatives. Um, and there are studies on Nisiman and Homo sapiens interbreeding that suggest that they persisted until at least 44,000 years ago. Um, now, on the subject of interbreeding, if we go to the next slide, mm. um, yeah, we now have a significant amount of evidence that our species interbred with several extinct humans, notably the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. Mm. Um, at least four separate interbreeding events occurred with the early members of Homo sapiens, Though it's likely that we'll discover that there were many more of them as more and better DNA sequences are gathered. And the implications behind these discoveries are nothing short of fascinating. So what do we know? Well, it seems that most, if not all, living members of our species today carry some DNA from our closest extinct relatives. Here's the numbers. Homo sapiens populations outside of Africa have about 3% ancestry from Neanderthals with a tiny bit more of that occurring in the DNA of folks on the eastern side of Eurasia than those on the western side, including Europe. 
uh, much of this interbreeding would have occurred as groups of Homo sapiens began expanding their populations away from Africa and Southwest Asia, anywhere between 70,000 and 50,000 years ago. Although there is evidence of an even earlier contribution from a population of Homo sapiens into the Neanderthal gene pool sometime around 350,000 years ago. And possibly there was one much later at 100,000 years ago, with the latter seeming to come from a group of Homo sapiens that came into contact with Siberian Neanderthals. Now, as you might recall from our 2020 Roundup show, um, it used to be understood that African populations of Homo sapiens had little or no ancestry from Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. uh, much of this Neanderthal DNA would have been introduced into Africa from Eurasian Homo sapiens entering from the outside, notably from Southwest Asian agriculturalists moving deep into East Africa and admixing with local forager groups at around 3,000 years ago. Um, we now know, thanks to a recent study from 2020, that there was actually a fairly good amount of Neanderthal DNA in Africa, mm -hmm. as high as 0.3%, uh, which, yeah, that, that, that is significantly higher than what was previously understood. Mm -hmm. Um, the researchers of that study argued that this DNA was given to African populations through admixture from incoming Homo sapiens groups from Europe. And this seems to have occurred as uh, much further back in time than previously understood, uh, after a period between 45 and 35,000 years ago. Now, turning to the mysterious Denisovans, we've been able to find some very curious results. Uh, among peoples of Oceania, and to be specific, the uh, Australian Aborigines, the Papuan speakers of New Guinea, Melanesians, and several groups from Eastern Indonesia and the Philippines can be found about 3.5% Denisovan ancestry. Mm, wow. And that amount of ancestry decreases the further north you go into Eurasia. So uh, East Asians, South, Southern Asians, Amerindians, and uh, Western Eurasian groups support only about 0.1% of Denisovan ancestry. Now, a very surprising result from a 2020 study that I seem to have missed somehow <laughs> uh, showed that there was needs of an ancestry in, of all places, people of Iceland. Huh. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You know, as in mainland Eurasian groups, it's a small amount, again, about 0.1% ancestry. But the fact that it's there at all is surprising. You know, by, by studying these DNA results, you know, we can be confident that, for example, uh, much of the Nisvan DNA in Oceanian Homo sapiens would have admixed as humans were settling in those places, at least between 55,000 and 45,000 years ago. But, you know, how did Nisvan DNA arrive in Iceland, of all places? You know, were, were, did the Denisovans just kind of do a big ocean voyage to, to Iceland? Um, yeah, that, that, that doesn't appear to be the case. And the authors of that study have no definitive answers either. Um, but they do mention that the Icelandic DNA does come from a population that diverged from other Denise events between 350,000 and 300,000 years ago. So that's very telling. Um, yeah, this admixture DNA from Denise events is very interesting. Um, you will recall how the DNA researchers have identified at least three regional variants among the Denise events hmm. based on studies of admixed human populations. Now, one of these variants included the Denise of a cave specimens which suggested that there has a greater range across Siberia than previously understood. Now, another of these was pinpointed in Eastern Asia, you know, the site of the Shahe Mandible, for example. Mm -hmm. And there was a third one, and this is really cool, uh, that's argued to have inhabited New Guinea and several surrounding Pacific islands. Wow. Now, that means that we have a case where another hominin, besides Homo sapiens, actually crossed Wallace's line. All right. Now... When would that have happened? Well, uh, this DNA study also gives us possible lineage separation dates. So the Siberian Denise events were the first to branch off around 363,000 years ago, while the East Asian and the Oceanian Denise events separated around 283,000 years ago. So yeah, people crossed Wallace's line a lot earlier than Homo sapiens did, mm. if that's the case. Now, to further complicate things, uh, Denisovans from the Siberian, as well as the Oceanian lineages, admixed with the ancestors of indigenous Pacific peoples. Wow. So, you know, my goodness, what, what histories have been lost to us? <laughs> you know? Indeed, yeah. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, you know, I, there's some graphics that kind of further clarify this Denisovan uh, DNA admixture that I've been talking about. 
Um, on the left shows the percentages of extinct human DNA in Southeast Asian and Oceanian groups, including those two uh, mystery extinct hominins that uh, I had talked about earlier that were distantly related to the Denisovans. Um, and the one on the right shows the three Denisovan regional variants, their divergence times, and just when they interbred with different Homo sapiens groups. Mm. So again, you can see uh, among Papuan speakers, there were two of these admixtures with the Denisovans. Now, interbreeding also occurred between Neanderthals and Denisovans, as exemplified by the 13-year-old Denny, who lived 90,000 years ago. Uh, she was the offspring of a female Neanderthal and a male Denisovan of the Siberian lineage. Mm. Now, given that the two species were so similar, and were even closer relatives to each other than they were to Homo sapiens, well, then it stands to reason that, you know, maybe mating between Neanderthals and Denisovans was probably easier. Mm. So, yeah, what are the implications for this fact that, you know, we interbred with now extinct human species? You know, what does that say about us? What does that say about them? Well, for starters, it tells us that, you know, we didn't find Neanderthals and Denisovans so different after all. You know, that we interbred and had offspring that survived to mm -hmm. spread across the world tells us that our, our evolutionary history is far more complicated than we could have ever imagined. I mean, Neanderthals and Neanderthals aren't just close relatives of us. They were, for the most part, our ancestors, mm -hmm. as much as our ancestors as our grandparents or our great grandparents and so on. You know, we inherited genes from these humans that impacted our physical well beings. And there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, what phenotypic and what genotypic traits Homo sapiens acquired from interbreeding with these extinct humans. Mm -hmm. you know, studies of all kinds have suggested that, oh, living humans got genes that help regulate skin and hair color, genes that impact how we handle certain diseases, uh, genes that impacted how the brain function, and, and on and on. You know, I don't have time to get into that here, but, you know, one important trait that some researchers have considered was our ability to move into cooler regions of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, Homo sapiens evolved in and around Africa, a continent that is mostly tropical, while Neanderthals and Denisovans, in some cases, uh, lived in temperate regions with marked winters and summers. You know, to have the genes that gave those humans advantages in places like glaciated Europe or uh, the Tibetan Plateau, you know, that would have been a great help for any Homo sapiens groups that expanded across greater Eurasia. Mm -hmm. Um, but, you know, what What was interbreeding like? You know, many authors have played with this in a bit of a romantic light. Mm. You know, Homo sapiens made with these humans so many times because they fell in love with them and they wanted to start families, mm. you know, making it a completely mutual, consensual process. Um, but, you know, the unfortunate thing is we'll never really know what motivated this interbreeding. Right. It, it's just as likely that many of these admixture events were the result of sexual assault due to some conflict between these species and in, in, in their territory. Um, or, you know, maybe it was a little bit more casual. You know, these humans were curious about each other and they just kind of wanted to experiment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, again, we, we will never know this for sure. Um, now there is one aspect to human interbreeding that I do need to mention briefly. Um, it does not appear to have been a perfect process, at least for the interbreeding concerned with Homo sapiens. Um, for the Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, miscarriages and birth defects seem to have been a high possibility. Mm -hmm. um, in the scanning of ancient DNA from Homo sapiens around the world, there have not been any traces of Neanderthal Y chromosomal DNA only mitochondrial DNA. Hmm. And that's really odd. And it implies that there were limitations to interbreeding and that over time matings between say male homo sapiens and female Neanderthals eventually caused the Neanderthal Y chromosome to vanish in the overall population and be replaced by the Y chromosomes of homo sapiens. And that suggests that the Neanderthal Y chromosome probably wasn't very common in the overall population at all. Mm -hmm. And that brings us to the saddening conclusion of this episode here on the next slide. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there is currently no consensus on why the Neanderthals and all the other Pleistocene human species went extinct, save for us. In the time since our species evolved, you know, they had been whittling down one by one mm -hmm. uh, 
Homo erectus in Southeast Asia was gone by 108,000 years ago. Uh, Homo friesensis had vanished from Flores Island by 50,000 years ago. And the Neanderthals and Denisovans held on until about 40,000 years ago, give or take one or 3,000 years. Mm -hmm. um, there are some Neanderthal sites in Gibraltar that have been variously dated to 30,000 or 28,000 years ago. And you might see these in some of the literature. Mm -hmm. um, but these have been contested in recent years because those dates were poorly sampled. The demise of the Denisovans has also been debated, um, but because our sample size is so poor, you know, it's it's really hard to make conclusions. Um, there is some DNA evidence from Homo sapiens admixture to suggest that, at least to a couple researchers, the Denisovans were still alive and interbreeding as late as 15,000 years ago. But uh, most of the paleoanthropologists cast huge doubt on this. Mm -hmm. um, they, they see a much earlier date for extinction for that lineage. Now, there have been a number of different hypotheses to explain what killed off the Neanderthals, the Nisifins, and the other now extinct species. Um, and one such idea is related to evidence regarding overall population data that I alluded to earlier. Now, the Neanderthals, for example, uh, were clearly highly adaptable across a wide range of environments in Western Eurasia, from forest to coast. And you know, if the genetic data holds up, you know, they had managed to separate themselves over time into three or maybe four regional variants that more often commingled within groups than between groups. And further evidence from archaeology, as well as DNA, seems to indicate that their overall population density was rather low, uh, with communities spread out over vast territories consisting of about maybe 10 or 20 or 30 individuals each. And these populations would have been at the mercy of the constant rise and fall of the ice sheets, which probably placed great pressures on Neanderthals during glacial periods. So not so severe that they couldn't adapt. Mm -hmm. I mean, the archaeological record clearly shows innovations were underway even towards the end of their life. So still, you know, the low population densities always run the risk of things like diseases or harmful genetic defects that would spread rapidly through generations. Mm -hmm. Now, researchers studying Neanderthal extinctions have noticed the sharp decline in numbers within the last tens of thousands of years of existence. Um, as you can see in the maps here from a study from last year, at 73,000 years ago, Neanderthal numbers were relatively stable and spread across much of Western Eurasia. But as we approach 53 to 48,000 years ago, this range begins to dwindle and we see Neanderthal populations further isolating themselves. Once we hit 38,000 years ago, they are uncommon and near extinction. Um, and by the way, I'm referencing the red maps here. Mm. Those green maps, those represent Homo sapiens population densities. Uh, and their numbers just increased dramatically in Western Eurasia throughout that time. And uh, so <laughs> there, there's an Eric Andre meme out there. Uh, I'm sure y'all <laughs> probably seen it. Um, it's the one where from his show where he he shoots Hannibal Burris and it's like why would X do this you know right. when it's clearly him doing it. <laughs> um, they made a bunch of them. They're really funny. Yeah. Uh, well, there's one where Eric is supposed to represent Homo sapiens, mm. while Hannibal is the Neanderthal and the Nevisa. Right. Right. The joke is like, oh, Homo sapiens deliberately wiped out the other human species and then has the gall to be like, you know, why are we alone in the human? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, it's, it's personally not my favorite version of that meme, mm -hmm. but I will admit, you know, after looking at the literature, there is probably something to that. Mm -hmm. um, so this same study from last year um, made a very strong case that our species did play a major role in the Neanderthal's extinction, at least. Um, but just how this was achieved is still ambiguous. Um, there is no evidence that there was a genocide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we do find some Neanderthal remains with suspicious looking wounds that might be from Homo sapiens, um, but they're too few in number to allow for pointing fingers. Mm -hmm. um, instead, this study suggests as Homo sapiens began to spread into Southwest Asia and then into Europe, they coexisted with Neanderthals for many thousands of years, enough to interbreed with them, but more often they outcompeted them for resources like mm -hmm. food. Um, Homo sapiens communities tended to be larger, more mobile, and had differing technologies that allowed them to gain a monopoly on game and plant foods. Uh, 
which would have gradually pushed Neanderthals into more marginalized habitats mm -hmm. until the last of them were so isolated, so limited, and perhaps even inbred that they died out completely, mm -hmm. only surviving within the genomes of Homo sapiens. Now, does that mean that our species would deliberately know what it was doing in this scenario? I, I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, but I'd imagine, you know, we didn't enter Europe, encounter Neanderthals and think, huh, you know what? Give us a couple thousand years and we'll rid the place of these guys. <laughs> right. um, you know, I, I tend to believe that prehistoric humans, even with an accurate understanding of their environment and all the plants and animals within it, you know, they probably didn't have concepts like extinction mm -hmm. or interspecies competition, um, at least in the way that we do today. Right. But I, I might be wrong on this, too. Mm -hmm. Um, now, there are certainly other hypotheses that have been considered. You know, maybe we were so good at interbreeding with Neanderthals and other human species, despite evidence to the contrary, that, you know, we just swall swallowed them up into our gene pool. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, the decline of the Neanderthal Y chromosome lends some support to this. Um, maybe there was an environmental catastrophe that was much worse than anything the Neanderthals had faced before. Um, for example, there is geologic evidence of, of an eruption around 39,000 years ago in Italy, which deposited, you know, so much at the dust and ash that it caused a volcanic winter across much of Europe that, you know, could have caused problems for an already dwindling Neanderthal population. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, there are all the suggestions of disease or genetic defects that I mentioned earlier. And as always, things could very well have been more complicated and involved some of these hypotheses happening at once. Mm -hmm. Um, I can easily see a scenario where Homo sapiens begins expanding into Europe and competing for resources with Neanderthals, who, as they join with the numbers, succumb to local diseases or harmful genes, with the final death nail being the uh, Italian volcanic eruption, oh, right. which would have helped further draw to their numbers until the last ones were left struggling in isolated pockets of Europe. And Homo sapiens just somehow managed to ride through it with different technologies and strategies. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we don't have enough data from the Denisovans or any of the other human species to even speculate on their demise. Um, there is some genetic evidence from the Denisovans, at least, that suggests that their populations might have undergone similar negative selection from interbreeding with Homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know what? In any case, after 40,000 years ago or so, there was only one human species on the Earth, and that was us, Homo sapiens. By then, we had already settled most of Eurasia and had moved deep into Australia. Uh, we were already expanding slowly up into Siberia and were on the horizon of settling the Americas for the first time. But by now, we were no longer sharing the planet with other humans. Hmm. Yes, all the Pethocenes had long since passed. Homo habilis and the other Habilines were gone too. Uh, the Erectines had been dead for some 60,000 years. And now the Neanderthals, Denise of and other Middle Pleistocene humans were slowly fading from memory. Mm -hmm. But, you know, let, let's not forget, of course, that, that we did interbreed with these close kin of ours, um, likely acquiring beneficial genes for dealing with harsh conditions or having traded technological or ecological knowledge to help us find our way in greater Eurasia. Mm -hmm. And, you know, let's consider, you know, how many humans walk the earth today that carry Neanderthal and Denise of genes. Um, I think the last count was 7.8 billion people. Mm. That means that there's probably more DNA from these lost humans around today than there may have ever been in the hundreds of thousands of years that they existed. That's true. Um, so, you know, if you think about it, maybe they're still with us in some way. Right. You know, maybe they're, you know, there there's more to the extinction than just a loss of species. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'll, I'll end on a quote from Mark Schultz's wonderful educational graphic novel, uh, The Stuff of Life, which is about genetics. You know, maybe to be human is to be Neanderthal. So, yeah, let's, I'm going to end on that note now. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, yeah. Um, the next episode, you know, we're going to turn to the other side of the fork in the road and enter the world of the first Homo sapiens. Uh, that is the African Middle Stone Age. Mm. You know, we're going to take a look at a number of interesting fossils before seeing how our gracile bodies, big foreheads, sunken faces, and pointy chins evolved from the middle Pleistocene Neanderthal-like phenotype. Hmm. You know, we're also going to dive into the African archaeological record, which is no stranger to discourse and mystery, hmm. to see how the ancestors of all living humans made a living through technological innovation, pan-African population expansion, 
and perhaps self-domestication. Hmm. So all that and more next time. Excellent. Uh, yeah, um, of course, I um, like to acknowledge our friends Henry and Alicia for their help in the series. Henry for the amazing music and Alicia for Albert's color scheme. <laughs> And, uh, you know, if you want to follow us for, on Twitter for updates, we are at Time and Clades. Of course, we post our episodes on our YouTube page through Time and Clades, where we have um, playlists where you can go through our individual series as well as our new shows. Mm -hmm. um, if you have any questions about the show, about Neanderthals, Nisabins, or just anything else in particular, feel free to email us at uh, you know, timeandclades at gmail.com or leave comments on our YouTube, uh, YouTube pages. Um, and of course, you know, <laughs> as is often the case, there's a huge list of references <laughs> for this episode that you can check out yourself, and we'll put them in the description so you can dive a little bit deeper into the world of the Neanderthals and Denise mm -hmm. um, And on that note, uh, what's next for us next week? Uh, right. So we still have one more week left of the month, I believe. So I think we're going to go back to my uh, series on bird evolution. Um and in that episode, uh, I intend to talk about, uh, well, I guess I'm giving away the title now. Uh, the title is going to be The Dinosaurs of the Sea. So, uh, you know, the origin of avian flight gets a lot of attention, but something else that it seems to have occurred with the origin of birds is kind of an increased tendency for dinosaurs to evolve into aquatic environments and one of the most spectacular radiations of uh, kind of marine adapted dinosaurs of all will be the group we'll talk about next time, including uh, penguins and petrels and loons and more. So, uh, yeah, uh, that'll be the next one. <laughs> awesome. That sounds exciting. We, we look forward to hearing from that. Um, but until then, we hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week and Indeed. or whenever you're watching this and <laughs> we'll see you next time. Yep. Take care, everybody.